Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Michigan Engineering DEI lecture. We're going to hear today about listening with the intent to engage, preventing our and deepening our perspective on preventing anti Asian racism. As many of you know, Michigan Engineering is in the midst of a culture shift. In the past year, we've had five community teams looking at proposals to educate everyone in our community on aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're interested in making our community more inclusive to everyone. So I'm very excited about the panel today. I also want to let you know that we have a DEI summit coming up starting on November 8th for everyone in the Michigan engineering community to celebrate our achievements in DEI. It's now our, my pleasure to introduce Professor Melissa Borja from University of Michigan, who will be the moderator for today's panel. Professor Borja is an assistant professor of American culture at the University of Michigan, where she is a core faculty member of the Asian Pacific Islander American Studies program. She researches re migration, religion, politics, pluralism, and race in the United States and the Pacific world. She earned a PhD in history from Columbia University, an MA from the University of Chicago, and an AB from Harvard University. So please join me in welcoming Melissa. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for participating in this critical conversation. As many of you know, the issue of anti-Asian racism has become a more visible issue in the past couple of years most notably in the wake of the massacre of Asian American women in Atlanta. But the reality is, is that acts of anti-Asian racism, violence and discrimination has been on the rise during the COVID-19 pandemic. And many scholars are worried that we'll continue to see acts of anti-Asian racism and violence occur as US-China tensions um, continue. So we have here an important conversation with many members of our community here to offer thoughts, reflections, advice, practical wisdom about how we can engage in this issue to make sure our university is safe and inclusive for Asian Pacific Islander American community members. So I'd like to shift to our panelists now. Um, our first panelist is Fatima Haq, Fatima. Please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you have engaged in the issue of anti-Asian racism. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fatima Hawk, and I'm an academic program manager and adjunct lecturer with the Barger Leadership Institute in LSNA. I'm also the president of Rising Voices, a progressive grassroots organization focusing on civic engagement and intersectional community organizing for Asian American women and families in the state of Michigan. For the last two summers, I've been teaching Asian American youth ages 16 to 20 in a youth leadership and civic engagement fellowship. In the fellowship, I teach a little about local government, how it works, organizing tactics, leadership theories and concepts. But most of my time is spent unpacking what it means to be Asian American. We learn AAPI history in the US going back to the 1800s. We talk about whether or not the fellows identify as Asian American, the model minority myth and how it affects them, if at all. And over and over again, I hear the same sentiments from fellows at the end of their fellowship. They didn't self-identify as Asian American prior to the fellowship. They didn't know any Asian American history. They weren't taught. They've developed a deeper understanding of who they are culturally and where they came from. And they felt seen in new ways. I think that we spend a lot of time reacting to anti-Asian hate. We want to know how to respond when it happens, but few of us put in the time and attention required to prevent it. I think one of the biggest things that faculty or those who work with students and curriculum can do is think about where AAPI fits into that topic that they're teaching. What I learned from teaching an AAPI Youth Fellowship and as an Asian American who didn't feel seen much, of, much in the years of schooling I've had is that AAPI perspectives are often omitted. John Dugan, a prominent leadership theorist calls this complicit omission. At the University of Michigan, I teach a class on leadership. And in teaching that class, I'm always thinking about how to incorporate Asian American histories and narratives. If I'm an Asian American woman, then what are some of the things that I might be thinking about when it comes to leadership? 
what are some of the cultural expectations that might be placed on me, rightfully so or not? What role would my peers want me to take just by looking at me? What assumptions might they be making about me? And what great Asian American leaders have they there been in our histories and what can I learn from them? These questions help me find ways to consider the perspective of others and find the places where AAPI are omitted. I'm obviously driven by self-interest. I am Asian American, I'm on the board of a nonprofit that serves Asian Americans, and I've spent a good chunk of my career teaching Asians in Asia. I'm embedded in the work, and so my learning is both intrinsically and extrinsically motivated, but anyone can do this work. If you're in engineering, for example, you might consider the impact of xenophobic, anti-Chinese rhetoric in the sciences, or examine your assumptions or judgments about who is fit to be a leader and who actually holds leadership positions. So how do we do that? It starts with what I've already mentioned, asking where Asian Americans are in literally any topic that we're teaching, that is, where have they been omitted? Um, this is so we can help our students feel seen, especially in a country where whenever race is brought up, it's usually in the black white binary. A second thing we can do is, is just learn a lot ourselves. Do you like to read? Uh, then read more Asian American authors. And there's lots of us out there. And I actually co-facilitate a national book club, the Unerased Book Club, where we read Asian American authors exclusively and discuss it. And if you don't like reading, there are many content creators out there now who are of Asian American descent, uh, who are working, who are doing the work for you. And you can follow them on virtually any social media platform. So several things happen when we do this. Students, all students, not just Asian students, start to see themselves as whole people with histories and feel a sense of inclusion and belonging. We gently combat stereotypes and assumptions because we start to internalize that Asian American isn't a huge monolith, that there are so many racial, ethnic, religious, and other groups encompassed in that label. And we humanize people, which is a necessity of stopping hate. Hate flourishes when we dehumanize people all who are different from us, uh, but we other them. And a lot of othering happens through the complicit omission I mentioned earlier. So for me, in order to prevent anti-AAPI hate, we should consider where Asian Americans are omitted and where they should be included. And there's no downside to teaching people who they are, where they come from, and it will make you a more humble, sensitive, uh, or better team member and educator. That's so wonderful. And you do such interesting work with youth related to politics, related to stories. You are also a writer and you brought up the importance of humanizing Asian Pacific Islander American people in order to prevent acts of hate, racism, and violence. So I wonder if you have one reading suggestion because you talked about the power of books that you might share with our audience. Yeah, I, there are so many books out there and I highly encourage you to check out the Unerased Book Club, uh, but um, the link will be shared with you. Um, a book that I actually just finished reading for the book club, um, it's called The Downstairs Girl. It's a young adult novel. Um, it actually locates um, Chinese Americans in Atlanta in the 1800s, which is something you might not be familiar with. And again, this is all about where do we, how do we locate and rewrite ourselves into the histories where we've been erased from, which is why I really enjoyed it. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you. Our next panelist is Hiryoung Choi. Hiryoung, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, what work you do at the University of Michigan and how um, we might meaningfully engage in the is addressing the issue of anti-Asian racism? Hi, uh, sure. So my name is Hiryum Choi. I am a sixth year PhD candidate in School of Information, University of Michigan. Uh, I spent most of my time in South Korea before I came to the U.S. for uh, pursuing my PhD degree. So after I, you know, arrived in the U.S. and it was a whole lot of like experience as an um, uh, international Asian student and also female student. Uh, so. But one thing I really want to talk about today uh, regarding what I did, uh, uh, relevant, which is relevant to anti-Asian uh, racism is that um, last March, a, uh, you know, a couple of Asian PhD students uh, and I myself wrote a, an open letter to University of Michigan School of Information Leadership uh, because um, we, so this, 
email, uh, actually the email we sent, the, this uh, open letter we sent to uh, was, uh, they're endorsed by a lot of like Asian and non-Asian LEs in University of Michigan School of Information. This open letter was a response to an email sent by UMSI leadership after the uh, anti-Asian mass shooting um, at Atlanta. And what I expected before I got the email from the leadership was, you know, leadership explicitly calling out white supremacy and anti-Asian hate, uh, anti-Asian hate or anti-Asian racism. Instead, what they did was simply just acknowledging that there are many Asian members in this community and we care. So uh, that almost felt like that was very striking and shocking to me because that as a, a community member, I believe I belong to that community. And therefore I thought, they will be more explicit about like, you know, those deeply rooted issue, which really is a big threat to us. So that's why uh, I and other like three, four PhD students uh, led this, uh, you know, open letter writing. And then uh, later, thanks to APIDA community, we uh, also slightly revised the open letter and then uh, shared it with uh, Michigan Daily. So, uh, one, so through this thing, I through this thing I learned uh, several things. It was very uh, important experience, and as as a anti uh, sorry as an Asian student, and one thing was that I through this through writing this open ed email, I learned that I can uh, how to validate my feeling as an Asian student. So this was something I've never done before. As a you know as a international students who feel like I don't know all the rules and all the cultural norm here. It is very, it, it, it could be very, you know, demanding and very, you know, exhausting to say that, hey, something might be wrong because it may, like, it just, when, I, when I say that, when I call that out loud, part of my brain is like, hey, maybe like you're not really understanding the culture here. And the other part of my brain is like, maybe you're not using the right language. Maybe it's your English. So all of those uh, thing have, things have been really uh, preventing me from validating my feeling when I face or encounter a threat to, you know, a uh, threat like anti-Asian racism. But what, what, like with writing this email and open it letter that uh, I learned that it is okay to feel anger. It is okay to feel sad. It is okay to feel, you know, all sort of feelings and no, like it is not okay for other people to tell you how you should feel about this particular uh, incident or other, you know, things I have been uh, going through. Thank you so much. Thank you also for writing the letter in the first place. Um, and I, I should point out there's a really rich history of Asian international students playing a critical role in advocating for justice on university campuses. And so you're part of a rich tradition. I wonder if there is one thing you feel like people should understand about the particular experiences of Asian international students, as opposed to um, Asian American students who are born in the US. I think sometimes there can be challenging organizing with these two groups in mind, but I often also think that we forget that there is a particular experience for Asian international students. So what is one thing you feel like people should know about the needs of Asian international students? The one thing I often uh, heard from non uh, Asian, uh, non like domestic students, especially like, you know, white students here or white faculty here or staff here are that International Asian students don't know how to get mingled with intern uh, with domestic students. But I want to point that out uh, that first, like Asian students are not monoliths. So if I interact with I'm a, as a Korean, if I interact with Chinese students or you know students from like other part of Asia, that's still like a lot of learning opportunity for me. And it is how I learn about other culture and you know other society. But because they just think, like often they just you know make this mistake that, that you look all very similar. So when you guys are together, I don't think you are you really know how to get mingled and you know you don't know how to get out of your comfort zone. And that really uh, bothered me a lot and sometimes like you know uh, pre like make me hesitant to be with other Asian students because I want to, you know, like 
it's really hard to admit, but like part of like part of my brain always telling me, hey, like maybe you have to, you know, interact with more like white people, right? So that you can be more like model minority. So um, I think that's one point I learned throughout my uh, staying in America. These are all such important points. I'm going to say that probably at least one other time throughout this session. Asian students are not a monolith. This is a really key point. Thank you so much. Our next Thank panelist, you. I'd like to hear from Marie Tang. Marie Tang, tell us about yourself, your position at the university, and what you think we should do to better address the issue of anti-Asian racism. Uh Thank you, Melissa. It's so great to be here uh, this afternoon and as part of this panel and this event. And thank you to the College of Engineering for organizing this. Um, I'm Marie Ting. I work at uh, U of M's National Center for Institutional Diversity, which is within the College of LSNA. Um, NCID represents a commitment by the University of Michigan to affirm the central value and undeniable importance of institutional diversity to the mission and colleges of all universities. Um, so for the purposes of my participation um, and role on this panel, um, I just wanted to share briefly um, about my background and kind of what brings me here to this panel. So um, I was a former student leader at the University of Michigan as an undergraduate, um, working um, with Asian American student as part of Asian American student organizations. And I wanted to say that I really stumbled into this work um, because in this community, um, not necessarily because I was looking for this community. So um, I'll say similar to what um, other panelists have said, um, um, I do feel like, and I agree that Asian Americans in our history are often invisible. And, I've, I, and I experienced that growing up in a predominantly white community. So when I came to the University of Michigan, um, I wasn't, again, looking for an Asian American community, but I, found an Asian American community. I found Asian American studies and being a part of these communities has really shaped um, my uh, journey in so many important ways. Um, so in that vein, um, I just wanted to say that this theme of community has been so important in my growth and development um, and understanding of what it means to be an Asian American. Um, and I wanted to say particularly in the uh, midst of this increase in anti-Asian violence, um, it is so important for me personally to know that there is a strong community here at the University of Michigan um, that, that I can turn to um, and that others can turn to. Um, and you know, it's just nice to have a community where you can just sit with somebody and you don't have to explain things and you can just kind of sit and nod in silence. And that is something that I did not have growing up. And that is something that I think is so important um, for us to have, particularly in these times. So speaking of community, um, I wanted to add as a resource, uh, there is a, I'm part of the U of M's Asian Pacific Islander Daisy American Staff Association. So that has been a really great community for me. And um, I would welcome other staff or others who are seeking community um, to join the PETA Staff Association or, um, if you don't have a community and you're looking for a community of um, APIA faculty or students, um, please, please contact me. I am glad and will be pleased to um, connect you with these resources. Thank you so much. One thing that is you know, important about your story, Marie, is that you have a long history at this wonderful university. and. Um, I've always leaned on you for providing tremendous institutional memory and knowledge about what it means to serve Asian Americans at the University of Michigan. So what do you think is some of the most important changes you witnessed during your time at the University of Michigan in what the needs are of these students? How does it compare to when you first arrived at U of M and, and what it's like now? Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say, and I will say I love, love, love this place. Um, I'm a two-time grad, and I have three brothers who are graduates, so my um, parents were used to writing uh, the tuition checks uh, for this place, so we really love this place. Um, I, I think that the changes um, kind of mirror the changes nationally in the Asian American. I think there's been more awareness since I was a student now. Um, 
you know, when I was a student, it was Asian Americans and there's Asian Pacific Islanders and there's Asian Pacific Islander Daisy. So I think in our awareness and growth um, of, of our community, you know, has sort of mirrored what's going on nationally. Um, I will also say, and this may be a good segue to the um, next panelist is um, the growth in Asian American studies has been so important um, to this institution and also to students. Um, when I was a student, there were maybe two classes that we could take. I remember taking Asian Intro to Asian American History and Asian American Literature. Um, there may have been more, but I was, you know, new to the Asian American Studies scene. But now, you know, there's a, there's a program, there's a minor. I mean, and there are people like you, there are people like Ian Shin. I mean, it, it is, the, the growth has been really great. And I think the support uh, for the program and the students that have been enrolling in the program has, have, has been wonderful to see. So I think for me, that is um, something that has changed a lot in a really good way. Thank you so much. I, I would say it feels like a gift every day to be able to teach Asian American studies at this university. So because you mentioned Ian Shin, let's turn to our final panelist, Ian Shin. Ian, could you please tell us about your work um, and how we can best address the issue of anti-Asian racism? Sure, and hi, everybody. Um, I wanna start by echoing what Marie said in terms of our gratitude to the College of Engineering for having all of us for this conversation today. Um, I am an assistant professor of US history and Asian American studies here at U of M, um, where with Melissa, uh, I'm a core faculty member in the Asian Pacific Islander American Studies program in the Department of American Culture. So in that capacity, I am fortunate to be able to incorporate AAPI history and culture into my work on a daily basis. So, for example, I'm one of the faculty members who teaches uh, our Intro to Asian Pacific Islander American Studies. Uh, and in Intro to APIA Studies, we read scholarly texts, we read novels, we watch movies, all of which celebrate and analyze the long history of AAPI experiences in the United States, as well as the challenges that our communities uh, face today. So for those of you who are undergraduates uh, on, in this webinar, I really encourage you to consider taking Intro to APIA Studies to fulfill your intellectual breadth credits um, in your education at the College of Engineering. Building on the platform that I'm privileged to have here at U of M, I've had the opportunity also to engage with a number of public facing initiatives and campaigns to try to shape our collective understanding of what has been happening over the last two years and how to respond uh, to some of these events. So in speaking with different media outlets, for example, um, our moderator, Melissa, and I have tried to correct some of the misinformation and common misperception that is out there about the racial background of the vast majority of the perpetrators and in incidents of anti-Asian hate speech and violence who have been white um, so that the Stop AAPI Hate campaign doesn't uh, doesn't become a wedge issue against other communities of color. And in thinking about this issue, I would especially recommend uh, a website called lettersforblacklives.com. This is a resource that was put together starting in 2016, but that has since been updated last year that provides guides in multiple Asian languages to facilitate conversations about the Black Lives Matter movement. It can sometimes be really difficult to translate something as politically and culturally sensitive as racial justice, polit police brutality, um, and anti-Blackness to our friends and families who are less familiar with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. So I encourage you to take a look at lettersforblacklives.com as a way to think about how to make sure uh, that the AAPI community is an equal partner in the struggle for racial justice in this country. One of the other gratifying parts of doing um, this work has been uh, Marie's invitation recently to serve on a committee working with NCID and with an organization called the Steve Fund to design a set of recommendations for colleges and universities to better support the mental health needs of AAPI college students. Research has shown us that anti-Asian bias and violence over the last 18 months has had a dramatic and negative impact on AAPI mental health. And even before the pandemic started though, 
we know that AAPIs had a lower rate of accessing mental health treatment compared to other racial and ethnic groups. And so I want to highlight that as a major issue um, that sometimes uh, we don't pay as much attention to and don't talk as much about. We're fortunate to have culturally competent counselors in CAPS here at the University of Michigan. There's more that the university surely can do, and I hope that the College of Engineering uh, will put in place various measures to support AAPI staff, faculty, and students in that regard. Finally, I want to say that I currently serve on the board of directors of an organization called the Association of Chinese Americans, which is a nonprofit that provides social services to and advocates for AAPIs here in southeastern Michigan. So in the spring after Atlanta, we had a three part series of events, including a town hall to address local residents concerns, a virtual celebration for AAPI Heritage Month, as well as a panel about the legacy um, of the murder of Vincent Chin in 1982. I mentioned this last uh, bit of, of um, community engagement because I think it's also important to look around us. Um, we are here certainly at the University of Michigan, but we also live in Ann Arbor, we live in Washtenaw County, we live in Southeastern Michigan. There is a history of AAPIs here in this place and it's important for us to engage with it as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I love that you shared the resource of Letters for Black Lives, which I think raises a really important question. How can we meaningfully engage in work to address racial injustice in collaboration and in support of other communities that experience racism or other forms of oppression? So I wonder if you could give us an example of what you have seen either in the past, because I know you are a historian, or in the present, of meaningful and effective work uh, that shows solidarity and coalition building. Well, I, I could talk forever about this, as you know, uh, but I'll try to be brief. I think one of the things that perhaps doesn't get as much airtime um, is the fact that in the history of Asian American activism, much of that activism really took place in conjunction with other communities of color, right? So the, the birth of the Asian American movement in the late 1960s coincides obviously with the civil rights movement. And we see a lot of Asian American activists who worked hand in hand with both African American and Latino activists uh, during that era in order to build uh, a more just country. Um, and so we see, for example, um, some of you may be familiar with activists named uh, Grace Lee Boggs, who lived here uh, locally in Detroit, or Yuri Kochiyama, who was an activist who lived in New York City, who supported uh, Malcolm X. Uh, those of you who are from California uh, may be familiar with uh, a Filipino uh, American activist named Larry Itliong, who actually partnered with Cesar Chavez um, for the, the um, great, um, the, the, uh, the agricultural worker strike, um, the Delano grape strike of 1962 and helped to find, um, to, to, to form the United Farm Workers uh, Union. All of these uh, examples show us that Asian Americans have been working in conjunction with other communities of color uh, for a very long time. More recently, I've been uh, really, heart, um, really heartened to see the support that Asian American communities have given to uh, the, the marches and protests that have taken place uh, in the aftermath um, of the death of George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, and others last year. And I think that is an ongoing campaign and an ongoing movement that I hope more Asian Americans will continue uh, to be a part of. Thank you so much. And I would just like to say thank you for mentioning Larry Idleon. It is in case you didn't know, Filipino American Heritage Month, October is when we celebrate that. So um, as a Filipino American, I appreciate that very much. Uh, so as you can all see, we have some amazing people who have a variety of experiences and positions on which they can in, um, talk about how we can uh, address issues of anti-Asian racism in our different contexts. I encourage you at this moment to add your questions through the Q&A function. Uh, if you heard something that you found interesting and you'd like to clarify something or get more uh, advice or um, follow up on something, please, this webinar is useful uh, primarily through your participation. So we uh, encourage you once again, submit your questions. As questions come in, I would like though to begin with a few general questions uh, for our panelists. 
So the first question, um, I'm going to direct in particular to um, Hir Young and Fatima first. So Hir Young, maybe you can answer first. The question is, how can I best support my Asian and Asian American colleagues and students? It's a very practical question. How can I best support my Asian and Asian American colleagues and students? Um, so Hir Young, why don't you go first and after that, Fatima, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, sure. So uh, as an international student, the one thing I really uh, didn't think uh, I so the one thing is like the basic thing you can start from is learn how to pronounce our names correctly. There is actually a research showing that that mispronounce, mispronouncing Asian students name in schools or like work can actually negatively impact students or uh, workers self perception and worldviews. So I mean, if you can pronounce like, you know, all the different names from like European countries, then you can like definitely, you know, pro, uh, pronounce like a, all the different like Asian uh, students name. The other thing I want to talk about is sort of relevant to what I uh, talked about brief, uh, briefly before. So I briefly mentioned that after I came here, I'd want to get mingled. And then I sort of, sort of uh, kind of made a mistake that, you know, I should, fit the model minority, you know, image that like, okay, so there's this expectation, I need to nail that, then I can be, you know, uh, I can fit in this society. So that's actually, um, I think that started from people uh, who try to impose their views on how immigrants or international students need to, what they need to know, or how they need to behave. The often, uh, the frequent thing I've heard is like, hey, that's not how you do it here. Or like, hey, you need to speak English better because we really don't really, uh, you know, if you want to stay here. So, I mean, they don't use that exact word, but basically they're implying that. And that not only just drop our confidence, but also kind of like, you know, wonder like, how, uh, like try to censor my own behavior or our own behavior in words, which, uh, is not desirable, obviously. So those two things I want to point out. For me, I think uh, uh, a lot of it has to do with like resource sharing. You know, there's a lot of information that is um, taken for granted that's con considered to be very commonly known. Um, and uh, if we could kind of highlight those things, that would be really wonderful. Um, for example, recently we had an addition to our staff uh, at the Barcher Leadership Institute. And one of the things that I made sure she knew as an Asian staff member um, is like there is a PETA, you know, and that there's an organization for staff members and where the communities are, where, pe where people are gathering and talking about these things. And so just sharing resources, whether it's with students or with, um, with your colleagues that you learn about uh, and letting them know some of these, um, uh, some of these um, unex or taken for granted uh, things that we just, uh, you know, forget that it's there because this is such a large institution. Marie or Anne, do you have any other things that you think you would like to add about this question about how we can show up to meaningfully support our Asian and Asian American students? I mean, I think maybe this would be a, a time to bring up one of the, the questions that was asked. I don't want to jump the queue, but one of the questions that's asked, I think, is really germane um, to the question we're talking about in terms of you know, how, how to support um, API faculty, staff, and students. And it's a question um, from the queue that said, you know, we can respect one another and our differences, but often respect is confused with being nice. Um, so, you know, can, can panelists share what respect looks, sounds, and acts like for them? And, and this, I think, gets to a little bit of the um, discussion around microaggressions um, and you know what what does it mean uh, to um, genuinely sort of show your support for and respect for uh, another culture and, and I think there's oftentimes um, a lot of kind of fear on the part of non-asian allies right who don't want to say the wrong things and that's really something that that um, I, I appreciate right as as kind of an intention I think something to also kind of understand is that um, 
the impact uh, of, of you know, what you do or what you say may be interpreted differently than what you intended. And it's okay because I think most people in the community under, appreciate you know, if someone um, you know, is making a good faith effort to try to learn more about a particular culture that's different from them or, or learn uh, about a particular background, um, but if, if they kind of you know, bungle it um, uh, inadvertently, that that's okay. Um, and I think, uh, you know, so, so I would encourage folks to, um, you know, learn more about, uh, um, you know, the Asian American uh, culture, cultural productions. Um, Fatima mentioned some of the books and movies and, um, you know, social influencers that are, that you can follow on TikTok and Instagram. Uh, and that's a good starting point. Um, I'm generally of the kind of um, opinion that, you know, we should welcome people, um, you know, in, in terms of inclusion, however they come to the table, right? Whatever brings them to the table, um, there's a seat for them here. Uh, and so, uh, but, but I think a, a willingness to learn, a willingness to ask questions uh, goes a long way when it comes to uh, respect versus being nice. Thank you so much. Um, I would say, you know, uh, one of the, I would add from my own experience, one of the most useful things is to simply um, help people be, be seen and, and to affirm that experiences that they have had are um, real. <laughs> I think there have been a lot of instances when Asian American students have described a situation that involves bias and people haven't always taken that seriously. So I think a lot of this is uh, affirming and listening to students and taking their stories and perspectives seriously. Let's talk about structural solutions. We've talked already about what happens at the interpersonal level, but what are some of the big structural things that need to happen? Um, so this is a question I'll begin with Ian and Marie. Uh, what can we do to advance uh, and support structural solutions to address um, anti-Asian racism and the issue of making sure that Asian Pacific Islander American people can live in safe and inclusive communities. Marie, why don't you go first? Um, well, I, I love this question about structures and this is you know, what we do at NCID. You know, we think about structural racism, we think about how to you know, tackle this huge um, issue. And one of the things that we do here um, that is, is applicable to this question is thinking about the research and scholarship, right? So how do we base our, our practices and policies on the latest and greatest research and scholarship on these issues? So um, in, in answer to that question, um, to advance um, and support structural solutions for anti-Asian Asian, Asian racism, I would say, you know, accessing the research on Asian, Asian American students issues on campus. I mean, we have two of the uh, nation's leading Asian American scholars here um, on this panel. Um, not that Ian and Melissa, not that I'm volunteering them to do more, but um, there are many scholars on this campus uh, who would be willing uh, to, you know, participate in talks, share their research, and there are scholars nationally that do this work. So I think we really need to access the research um, and access scholars. Um, I'll, I'll add two things really quickly. I think the, the first thing, um, well, actually before I say that, I think that the, the premise of the question, we should just kind of um, highlight, the reason we're talking about structure is because while there is a very important interpersonal dynamic at play when it comes to supporting and respecting your Asian American and Pacific Islander colleagues um, and students, there's also the question of how to create lasting sustainable change, right? That that is going to move forward and create a foundation um, for, for the API community, right? As Melissa was saying, um, to, uh, to be part of a, a safe and thriving community. Um, so there are two things that I, I think are um, things that, that come to mind. The first is, you know, at the um, at the level of, you know, the college or the university, one of the things that I know Marie, I, and others on this webinar have um, also been advocating for is the disaggregation um, of data um, and to be able to understand the very specific differences between the achievement levels of, for example, South Asian or East Asians versus Southeast Asians, uh, groups from uh, Laos and Cambodia uh, and Vietnam, for example, right? There are vast disparities and we have lots of research 
it shows not only on education, but also an income level, that there are vast disparities within the AAPI community. And so uh, fighting for these kinds of policy changes uh, at the college or university level will help to support members of the AAPI community that need perhaps a little bit more resources and a little bit more support. The other structural solution I want to advocate for is for those of you who, you know, were listening to Fatima's uh, remarks earlier and uh, really resonating with them in terms of your own experience, not learning a lot about AAPI history uh, and experiences and literature when you were growing up, there is a growing um, and increasingly successful movement to fight for inclusion of AAPI related curriculum at the K-12 level. So some of you may know that Illinois was recently the first state in the country to mandate the inclusion of AAPI history history um, in its um, elementary uh, and secondary schools. Um, there is uh, ongoing efforts in uh, states around the country, including in Michigan. And for those of you who are interested in getting involved, that is a really good way to, again, set a foundation where from the get-go, not only Asian American and Pacific Islander students will know that their, uh, their experiences are valid, but that others will also learn from the get-go to respect and uh, to, to value uh, Asian American history uh, and Asian American experiences. Thank you, Ian. I'm curious, Fatima and Hiryang, do you have any thoughts about measures we can take to address this issue of anti-Asian racism on a more structural level? So one of the things that comes to mind is actually through my community organizing work with Rising Voices, which involves really um, increasing helping helping Asian American women and families is um, get more civically engaged, but not just during election periods, but also during other times. And so there's a lot of positions on school boards and other things where a lot of people don't even know what all is happening in those positions, right? In community, the community spaces where a lot of leadership positions are being made. So again, I go back to that point of like, let people know that these positions are open, that they should consider because they're thinking about it. They're thinking about their kids going to school. They're thinking about what's available in the library or what the park system looks like or things like that. There's a lot of positions open. And I think that Asian Americans are woefully underrepresented in those spaces. And so thinking about how can we have more people on our HOA boards and you know people of color, not just say Asian Americans um, on our library boards, on our you know school boards or whatever it is, a lot of important decisions such as the curriculum, you know, of what what schools are allowed to teach or not teach is um, is made in those spaces. So just opening that up and seeking out a more diverse pool of people and actually actively uh, um, encouraging that sort of participation. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more about the power of civic engagement and political engagement. Mention this as the daughter of one of the first Asian American school board members in Michigan. Um, this is a really powerful way to make sure that our communities and our children in particular are getting the types of education that are affirming and supportive, safe and inclusive. So I think it's a good time now to shift to some of the questions we've received from our audience. And we've received some really good ones, one of which has been referenced by Ian already, um, this question of respect and what that looks like. So here's the question. We can respect one another and our differences, but often respect is confused with being nice. Can any of the panelists share what respect looks, sounds, acts like for them. So what does respect look like in your view? I know Ian commented on this, but here young, um, why don't you go ahead and, and respond to this and anyone else would like to, to follow up? Sure, uh, I'll definitely want to second what Ian said. Uh, it's, so there's a huge difference between a person who are willing to learn and who are willing to change their a way of thinking or you know way that how they behave versus people who are just interest like so 
I saw, I, I meet a lot of people who are interested in like Asian culture and often they, you know, ask questions which could be very, um, you know, which could be not really, uh, inter not really nice to us, although their intention was nice. So the problem is they're just interested without learning anything or they are not really, you know, willing to change anything. So when we said, hey, I think that question you ask or that thing you just said is kind of, for example, like very stereotypical, you know, thought, which might not be, you know, good. I don't really agree with that. And then you can see if based on how people respond to us, then you can tell this person is um, just try to be nice without really, you know, willing to learn anything or change their behavior. So there's definitely that uh, part, which is really important. And the other thing is, uh, so don't stop just, you know, don't stop there and say, hey, I'm willing to change. So don't say educate me, educate me. Don't say that, but please go ahead and explore more, uh, you know, resources. So there are lots of resources uh, already on the chat and there are a lot other resources on online. So uh, when you think you are, you know, you're willing to change your behavior, like willing to learn about it, uh, it don't, ask Asian people like, hey, educate us, like I'm here, right? So what I, I, I guess what I want to say is like be more proactive and uh, try not to be too uh, passive, if that makes sense. Do others have any further thoughts on this question of what respect looks like? Okay, great. Well, let's move on to another question, and I and I think it might be particularly interesting for a very international university like the University of Michigan and a particularly international college like the College of Engineering. So what are the best ways we can connect with international students? How can we make our programs, our events, our classes more accessible, more welcoming, more inclusive to this population? And I think the most obvious person to be <laughs> respond to this question first is Hir Young. Um, so Hir Young, what are your thoughts? And then after that, I um, encourage Ian, Marie, or um, Fatima to add, offer feedback too. Um, so the question was how we can support and connect with international students. And of course, I can only talk about talk uh, about how international Asian students, especially in my case, East Asian students, would. Feel. And the first thing I want to say is, as I said, like, don't treat us like a monolith, although we look pretty much like, you know, for, for like, you know, from people who are not in our community, we might look similar, but we all have different culture and history. So please respect that. And, you know, uh, so that's, so there was like, there was many times because I guess I look like Chinese students. So there were many times when like people who tried to try, had problem with, Chinese student, you know, they like, or like want to understand more, they come to us and ask like, hey, can you speak like Chinese? Or like, can you understand this? And that actually might be just simple like question to them, but that actually hurts. Like, because I feel like they are not really trying to understand my, my background and uh, don't cons uh, respect me as an individual from a rich history of my own, right? Own culture and uh, country. So that's one thing. And um, there are many things. As they, there are many things, but one thing is, uh, if you uh, so in 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 the school information uh, where I belong, there is this uh, like event where people celebrate, for example, uh, moon festival. Like so, that's actually so. This is actually a really easy thing to do because uh, when you get when you design those kind of events, you can actually uh, ask Asian students or people who actually celebrate that day to participate and ask their input, like, "Hey, what do you do? What do you eat?" or those kind of things. And then open by opening that event and you know giving those Asian students to share their own history and culture, it kind of uh, it's one way to make them feel uh, like they belong here and they have something to contribute to this, uh, you know, uh, community as a, although they, 
word uh, they are international, which sometimes make feel like they are stranger there, right? So uh, that's one example, I guess. I can maybe offer uh, a couple of thoughts. I think um, one very tactical thing that I learned um, as, uh, and I, I myself am an immigrant, I was born in Hong Kong, and uh, so I'm one and a half generation. I came here when I was nine years old um, to the United States. Um, and uh, people are often surprised by that because they're like, oh, you don't have an accent. And that's one of the fun kind of microaggressions that I, I get to um, experience on a regular basis. Um, but, but it actually applied to me in, in a particular um, case as, a, as an instructor um, a couple of years ago when I was teaching a course. Um, and in terms of creating an inclusive learning environment for Asian international students, one of the things that I realized um, because of a piece of feedback that uh, an Asian international student gave me is just that I talk too fast. And it was really hard to understand the material in my class because my lectures went by really quickly and I generally had a more narrative lecture style where I would put fewer text, uh, less text on a slide and show more pictures and kind of talk through it um, you know, uh, um, in, in my lectures. Um, and I realized that I had to kind of reconfigure the way that I taught in order for my slides to be more inclusive um, of Asian international students, but I'm sure that it also benefited students with other learning styles, for example, or other learning approaches. So I think, you know, one of the things that's great about um, designing a more inclusive learning uh, environment in my class, for example, is that it, it's not uh, just a, a win for Asian international students, it's in fact a win for all of my students. Uh, and so that's one of the very kind of, you know, tactical things, again, that I uh, sort of realized uh, in terms of how to support and connect with Asian international students as a faculty member. Fatima and, and Marie, do you have any reflections on this question? Um, I apologize. I think I'm having a bit of delay with my internet, so I hope that this is going to work out okay. I, I would add that some of the uh, regulations regarding immigration students have put, or excuse me, re, um, immigration regulations regarding international students have put international students in a very difficult situation, um, in a very precarious system our situation. And so moving forward, I think we should keep in mind also that ongoing immigration politics could um, make international students feel more or less welcome or uncertain about their future. So remembering that there are broader politics that impact their well-being at the university is really important. We have about five minutes left. So I'd like to ask one final question. Um, and it has to do with uh, what University of Michigan administration, faculty um, and staff, students can do to support the APIDA community here uh, generally, as well as um, sort of more broadly. And I, I would also weave in a second question that I think is just as important. Um, I wonder if either any of you have comments about me meaningful mentorship programs that are available locally for Asian and Asian American students that we can get involved in. So there are actually two separate questions. One's a general theme and, and one's a more specific question. I invite um, anyone to answer any of those questions if you have any responses. So Melissa, I'll, I'll just jump in uh, with your first question about um, you know, the institution and administration and, and how to support Asian Americans, um, particularly on this campus. And I think this goes to the question about structural solutions. So um, there is an organization called Indigo, which is the Asian Asian American Faculty Alliance in LSNA. And they've talked a lot about the lack of Asian American uh, leaders um, in the college, but also within the university as a whole. And, and, you know, leadership matters, representation matters, um, you know, a, for, for aspiring leaders to see Asian Americans in those roles make a difference. And I think to have Asian American leaders in roles um, who are, um, you know, who support DEI issues 
is uh, really critical um, and um, is really an important thing for the um, institution to pay attention to, not just here, but also nationally. I think the, the other thing that I would add in terms of, um, you know, how to get the administration to pay attention is, you know, the, the, there's a way to think about it that's uh, about the carrot um, for the administration. So one of the things that um, was a really happy piece of news for those of us, you know, who are invested in Asian American studies is that uh, I think last month, uh, Melissa's uh, alma mater, Harvard University, received a $45 million donation from a group of alumni um, who uh, are intending for that pot of money to support the development of Asian American studies um, at Harvard. Um, you know, there's no reason given the, the, the large and very active um, and influential body of Asian and Asian American alumni at U of M, you know, that we couldn't get a similar level kind of support and investment in the university to put its money where its mouth is when it comes to creating, you know, not just Asian American studies programs, which we're very fortunate to have had since the late 1980s, but also uh, to create the kind of uh, student support structures, centers, um, and uh, other offices, right, that would uh, help uh, Asian Americans uh, and Asian international students um, thrive here at U of M. So uh, I encourage you to make your voice heard. I encourage you to talk to your friends who've graduated from U of M. Uh, we all know how important alumni are, uh, you know, for this university uh, and to get them involved uh, in some of the things that we're talking about. Wonderful. Fatima here, Young, do you have any final thoughts on this question about what the administration can do to support um, Asian Americans more generally or mentorship? Um, I think one of the biggest things I've seen come across is uh, increases, increased support for mental health. Uh, and I think that that's an area that is uh, under resourced for all students, but particularly Asian American students. And uh, as they are confronting a lot of different things, whether it is immigration, regu you know, rules and regulation that limits or kind of creates obstacles or stressors for international students or um, for those who are experiencing micro and macro aggressions here on campus, you know, there's the for a while, I was following the Instagram account uh, around um, AAPI hate that was happening here on campus and people sharing their narratives about it. So just just thinking about what kinds of mental health resources can we actually provide students and how do we make that more accessible? Um, and we just simply don't have enough of it at the moment. It takes a while to even see anyone. Um, yeah, so increasing that. The other thing I want to briefly mention is that uh, I hope that more people who could be in mentor position like faculty or like staff uh, who are especially not Asian uh, would be more interested in like Asian issues. So, you know, it would be great if there are more like, you know, uh, workshop or resources or seminar, especially for them, because uh, considering that there are lots of like white faculty in like Asian student match in like, you know, PhD program or master's program is really important how they behave and how they, uh, you know, walk, uh, how they welcome these Asian students in their community. So, and I know I'm not saying like they are not really interested. It's more like, uh, it'll be great if there are more resource, you know, more accessible and more easily available for, especially for faculty. Thank you so much. Well, this has been a wonderful panel. I'd like to thank you all so much for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Um, I'd like to remind our audience that the next engagement will be in winter 2022 as part of this three-part series on combating anti-Asian hate, harassment, violence, and racism. Thank you to our co-sponsors for this event and our series, the College of Engineering's lecture series, the PETA Staff Association and GRIN, G-R-I-N. Attendees will re receive a short survey in a few days. Please take a few moments to fill that out to let us know your thoughts and attend the next DEI lecture on November 10th, please. Again, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Have a wonderful day.